Imagine a world in which a major form of transport had been virtually wiped away. Actually, forget that. We don't need to imagine it. We don't have the choice. Yeah. That's what's been taken away from us. Well, it is a nightmare, a complete nightmare. Yeah. There's always a problem, always. So before you've even gone anywhere, you're stressed. this man. What he did in the 1960s annoyed a lot of people. 45 years on, what Dr Richard Beeching did is still annoying a lot of people, even some who've never heard of him. Is um, Dr Beeching still with us? Dr Beeching is not still with us. Why? Would you, were you thinking of taking him out yourself? No, I just, uh, <laughs> I just thought it wouldn't be overly popular if he was living in Marple, would he? No. I have to say, as someone who doesn't drive, hates traffic queues and relies on the railways, I haven't mourned Dr Beeching much myself. I'm Stuart McConey. I present a show on Radio 2 from the BBC in Manchester. BBC, Radio 2. Since we're feeling a little reflective tonight, I think we'll start with some of the uh, late lamented Nick Drake, shall we? Music's one of my passions. Railways are another. So who was he, this Dr Beeching? A name known to generations. A name I can remember my dad talking about when I was a kid. A hate figure. An axe-wielding, very English bogeyman. In a nice suit. Dr Beeching was brought in from ICI and put in charge of British Railways in 1962 when they were losing loads of money. His solution? Rip out 4,000 miles of uneconomic track, close 3,000 stations and scrap the age of steam. Instead, an age of craziness in which entire communities were cut off. The North West got off relatively lightly. Poverty levels were high, car ownership was low, people needed the railways, and so wholesale closures were difficult to justify. Nevertheless, plenty of places around here did still feel the sharp edge of Dr Beeching's axe. And look at Manchester now. Transport in a pickle. Congestion charge looming. How much is Beeching answerable for? Later in the programme, we'll test that. Post beaching, which is quicker, car or plimsolls? Meanwhile, how far has the man himself been swallowed by history? Would the name Dr. Beaching mean anything to you? Oh, indeed it does. And what does it mean? A complete annihilation of all the rail network. Uh, I think it's a bit of a joke, one, not I just remember, you know, a distraught brother who used to be a train spotter. That's what I remember. For someone who had, was supposed to have an analytical approach to problem solving, he was the pits. To give Beeching his due, he thought he was managing terminal decline, pruning back a dying tree to its remaining healthy shoots. Everyone thought rail was finished and the future was the car. So what would the world have looked like if they'd been right? 
Well, in this city, we don't need to imagine what happens when a major form of transport dies. This place was once throbbing. These canals and Castlefield were the arteries at the heart of the most powerful economy in the world, the British Empire. And guess what force killed them off? One of the beauties of it is it's so simple, isn't it? I hadn't really thought about that before. You put coal in, the water boils, steam comes out, it moves us along. Pretty much, it? yes. Um, with this being an old locomotive design from 1830, this is pretty much the first loco design that encompassed all the modern points of a, a steam locomotive. The truth is, I love trains not so much for the oiliness and the smelliness which real enthusiasts enjoy, but for the romance. The way they've become woven into our cultural fabric, from Brief Encounter to Harry Potter to the 39 Steps. There's something about the romance of trains which fascinates the English and lingers in the nation's imagination. We're at the Manchester Museum of Science and Industry, and this is where it all began, where the world's first passenger railway opened in 1830, running between here and Liverpool. And two things attended its birth, congestion and furious controversy. Funny that, isn't it? It's no coincidence that Liverpool Road Station, the terminus for that first passenger service, was built here adjoining the old canal basin, which is just beyond those buildings there. The railway was constructed so close to the inland waterways network in order to siphon off their trade. Now, the people who ran the canals weren't happy at all about this because they thought they'd be done for. And they were right. That's not to say that things went entirely smoothly at first. On the opening day of that first passenger service, as the train made its inaugural run, razzmatazz, buntings, fanfares, VIP guests, the train actually struck one of those VIP guests, an MP for Liverpool, and killed him. Thus was born the love-hate relationship between the British and their railways. In truth, Beeching inherited a mess. Take South Manchester, tangle of routes and stations opened by rival railway companies, too much supply, not enough demand. He cut a swathe through them. Trouble is, his bottom line was business viability, not social need. The result? Welcome to Rush Hour Marple. Marple, 12 miles from Manchester, used to be nicely served by the railways. Then, Dr Beeching scrapped the five-mile link to Stockport. A place where lots of people want to go. Before Beeching, you could have got from Marple to Stockport from two stations. This is one of them, Rose Hill. It used to be really busy. For instance, this car park was once a thriving depot for coal arriving in Marple for domestic use. Now, well, it's a car park. There's the odd bit of nutty slack down there at the bottom in the yard, but all of the coal arrives by road. <laughs> 20 trains a day still leave this station but the overall feel is, well, really rather sad. It feels abandoned and a bit of a relic. Down there, you can see where Beeching's act actually fell, cutting across the track, trees growing across the line, and beyond that, the track torn up in 1970, a bit later than Beeching, but part of his wave of closures. That, for Rose Hill, is quite literally the end of the line. If you do come down on foot today, though, past the end of the line, past the trees, you'll see just what did become of that old Macclesfield, Bollington and Marple Railway. People have made the best of it, as with lots of disused rail routes. It's now the 10-mile Middlewood Way for walkers, cyclists and horse riders. 
great for the environment, not much use to commuters though. Of course, there's always Marple, the town's second station. There's a bit of that love-hate relationship between us and the railways, though, here as well. For instance, it's said around these parts that St Martin's Church, just here, right next to the station, was built deliberately to stop the station's expansion. Now, Marple's great if you're a commuter, and you're heading for Manchester. It's splendid if you're setting off for Sheffield. If you just want to get to Stockport, though, you're stuck with the road. And you know what? Something bugs me about the whole situation in Marple, just like what beaching did bugs me in other places where I stumble upon it, like my beloved Cumbria. I don't really know what beaching was thinking here. He closed down the line from Keswick to Cockermouth, right across the heart of the Lake District, a line I would have thought still hugely viable, both for tourists and for local commuters, a line that's still being fought over and reopening is still on the cards. And yet, he left this pointless spur here, serving no one that couldn't be served equally well by Marple just down the road. Like so many ruthlessly pragmatic business decisions, it actually just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Just getting my rant in first. I'm sure there'll be others who'll want to turn. So what do a professor of work psychology called Lynn, a scurrily fit woman called Elaine, Phil, the landlord of this pub, the Royal Oak, and a cabbie called Mike have in common? Answer their journey on this road, the A626 from Marple to Stockport, and their sense of loathing. Hello, everyone. Hi, Stuart. Hi, Stuart. Miserable day. Yeah. Now, how's Dr. Beeching affected your life when he uh, closed that line between Marple and Stockport? I mean, at one time, I clocked one trip at one hour and 35 minutes. Right, and, and I, Phil, what, 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 and what distance are we talking? It's only about four miles, isn't it? Five? It has taken me, you know, an hour and a quarter to drive from my house into the centre of Stockport before now, but I can run it so much quicker. Mike, is it notorious among taxi drivers? I mean, is it a particularly bad road compared to the ones in the area? I would say, I go as far as to say, it's probably the worst one in the northwest. It's notorious as much that you're only two ways to get into Stockport. If you're not allowing yourself an hour, after half past six in the morning, there's no way you will get to Stockport to catch your train. I agree. You've got to allow an hour. A lot of us, you know, if we want to go to London, for example, on the train, then it makes sense to go to your nearest main station, which is Stockport, which is just yeah. a few yeah. miles away. So most people used to drive to Stockport and park. But now the congestion has got so big, the number of cars in Stockport, that you can't actually go be guaranteed a place in the car park. That's interesting because you were supposed to park. That's what Beeching thought you'd do. Drive your car in a short distance, park, and then go and take your train. But it, it's not that easy now. We've got problems he didn't foresee, haven't we? Like, there's too many cars. Uh, you're saying you can't park. It's almost impossible. Yeah. So most of my friends now who want to get the train uh, from Stockport to London, which makes sense, it's only a few miles, yeah. actually get the train all the way into Manchester and then they wait for a train to go to London and then when they come back they do the same. So they can add on to their journey to London two hours if they miss connections for the sake of a few miles. It's yeah. absolutely crazy. It's Mike, you were uh, you first spotted uh, Elaine, didn't you, as part when you were on your run and she was on hers, as it were? Well, initially, what actually happened? I'm travelling to Stockport, and who should I see? It was Elaine, running down. Yeah. And the next time I saw her, she was going into her office on Victoria House in mm. Stockport. She beat me to Stockport. So you think there's a realistic chance you could, you have done, and perhaps could again, run to Stockport faster than the car can get? Oh yeah, I, I, I should think there's no doubt about that. That sounds to me like a gauntlet being thrown down. Well, go on, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly, we're going to have to take her up on that challenge. But surely there's a simple answer to the problem of the A626 and its traffic. Couldn't somewhere be found to reopen the old rail link? Well, that's just silly, of course. Why keep your options open when you can build a supermarket and other stuff right on top of the old railway line? Yeah, it's just down here. Right. right. We'll have to just climb over the barrier. OK. Phil yeah, took me yeah. to Morrison's in Bredbury. Down here. It's just oh, down here. You can see, you can see yeah, the here buffers. It is. Here it is. And there's actually an old carriage there. Listen, it's like, have they just abandoned that? 
They're just like parked it, yeah. up. Blimey. But there you are, you can see you'd have to yeah, yeah, yeah. They've build a tunnel. They've built... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, they were certainly, right over it. certainly convinced it wasn't going to reopen, weren't they? Seems no one has an appetite for reopening old lines for trains, let alone building new ones. Ironic, then, that a form of transport beaching would have thought obsolete is breathing new life into notions of rail travel. Manchester's modern Metrolink tram system is the great white hope of the congestion charge proposals. Not everywhere, though, will be part of the age of the tram. And they're not happy. Places like Cheadle. No trams for them under those plans. The congestion charge is something that the government very much wants. It's told Manchester, in fact, that the city can only bring in its £3 billion worth of transport improvements if it introduces the charge. Now, that's a tricky one for local councils because not everyone wants to pay a levy each time they go in or out of the city. Politicians hate doing unpopular things like that. It loses them elections. If the council gets the £3 billion, Lots of it will be spent on a form of transport which comes in for as much stick as the trains. Beeching thought buses would come to the rescue too when he scrapped stations and local railways. Cheadle definitely needed rescuing. The town used to be spoiled. It had two stations of its own, Cheadle and Cheadle Heath. No way was Dr Beeching going to put up with that kind of extravagance, of course. And to be honest, this station, Cheadle, was never any good for getting to Manchester anyway. Trains from here went to Stockport and Liverpool. You went down the road to Cheadle Heath for a train to Manchester, and that station's now vanished. This one isn't much cop anymore either. Not unless you fancy a pint, of course. Leaving you and people like Elizabeth, Carol and Dawn with the buses, or a long walk to the nearest station. No. The so nearest one is three miles away or three quarters of the mile away. Three miles or three quarters of a mile? Cheadle Hume is three miles right. and three quarters of a mile to Gatlin. So it's not, it's not really a viable thing to do? Not really. Where are we going at the back? They've invited me to join them on the rush hour trip to work in Manchester. Now normally they'd catch an earlier and older bus than this run by another company to avoid the traffic. But even on this one, it's hard to hear yourself think when they launch into the litany of bus complaints. Very fusty smelling, noisy buses. No heating in winter. In summer, you're boiling hot because the heaters are blaring. You can have the windows open, it doesn't make any difference. It's the infrequency of the service during peak times. Yeah. That is so frustrating. I don't understand. It seems to be that the bus that we normally get now, the buses are um, the ones that really are fit for the narco's yard, basically. Yeah, the we should say that the normal bus that you get, that company wouldn't let us film on their buses, they were given the opportunity. But um, so, so why would you normally come so much earlier? Because the, tra the, well, traffic, the traffic's really see. bad, you can see the traffic's horrendous yeah. and there's lots of people down on the bus. There are plans afoot for a congestion charge in Manchester and how, uh, what do you think about that? How will that affect you? Oh, I'm totally against it. You're against it? I am. Yeah. Um, it's just penalising everybody, really. Yeah. I mean, I know there are, you know, you're for it, aren't you? Uh, no. I mean, no, I'm, not. I'm only I'm only for it in the sense that you know it'll appeal. Hopefully, it make less traffic in Manchester. But right. by the same rule, yes. you know the, the charges are going to be horrendous. Yeah. Um, because you're going to hit at least two zones. Would you use trains if trains were available? Because again, it comes down to you know money, the cost, uh, the cost of uh, uh, travelling. You have to weigh up the pros and the cons. The cost of trains is something I'm something of an expert on because despite the best or worst efforts of Dr Beeching, some lines did survive his acts, like the West Coast Main Line, something on which I spend an awful lot of time and an awful lot of money. Often, we can't avoid going on the train. It can be quicker than flying, it's certainly quicker than driving, and the West Coast Main Line is what it promotes itself as being, a linchpin of the economy of the North West. There are some definite pluses about travelling by train, but a big minus is the feeling of being held to ransom. 
at £230 for an open return between Manchester and London. That feels more like a king's ransom. And this first structure, the ticket options, there's so many of them, they change more regularly than premiership managers, they're so complicated, does anyone really understand them all? But I just found it amazing that in the same spreadsheet you've got prices which are like five, six times more. Yeah. So for the same train, yeah. uh, from the same destination. It's extortionary yeah. for what it is really. Yeah. For the, the length, you know, the distance yeah. and the time it takes. The hours that you can actually travel, that's the big problem really, yeah. that you can't travel bef you know, between 3.30, I think, and um, 6.30. Yeah. And that's the, re the period where you know, most of your meetings have en ended, yeah, yeah. and you really just want to get home, yeah. and you can't. I mean, if you don't mind me asking, what have you paid today? Um, about 68 pounds. 68 quid. But I think like, can't, you can pay like 230. Right? Yes, yeah. if I'd have come on the half an hour earlier, I'd have paid about 180, 190 pounds. So there's a, there's a big difference. Yeah. Um, and I don't understand why. <laughs> this is Anna, who's our lovely minder from Virgin. Hello. Hi, hello. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Do you understand all the different ticket categories? Yeah. OK. <laughs> OK. What's the difference between a advance first and a first open return? Um, advanced tickets, as the name says, you have to book in advance and it will be much cheaper than uh, the other. Yes, it is, yeah, yeah. And a standard open return just means in, stand, in standard class, yeah. Yep, yep. What's a Virgin Groupie? Virgin Groupie? Yeah, that's not just someone who's very keen on Virgin trains, is it? Yeah. No. What, it says Virgin Groupie, is that... Negotiate the confusion, fork out for a ticket, and you can still find yourself with a pretty uncomfortable seat or standing for two hours. A fact which helps explain the Houston Concourse stampede for a decent seat when the platform's announced for that first cheap train back. Some of those Houston commuters could do with a spot of training with Elaine preparing for our foot versus wheels challenge in Marple. Morning. Good morning. I see you're all ready for it. I am ready for it and the weather is too. Right, here we are, here's the transport and you really think, Helen, you've got a chance of running to Stockport before we can get here in this mighty beast of a van? I definitely do, it's heavy traffic today, everyone's back at school, it's a rainy day, so yes, I've got a, I've got a good chance. OK, then go on, you convince me. Let's go, let's have a go. On your marks, get set, go. Actually, thinking about it, I'm not really dressed for this. You go on ahead. Last one to stop for is a sissy. Now, by the time Mike, Lynn, Phil and the crew are safely on board as well, Elaine is nowhere to be seen. No problem, though, for our jet-powered super wagon. Right, then. She reckons she can beat us, what do you think? Had no chance. No chance. Absolutely okay. not. Okay, well, let's see. Yeah. You have to say, we're not making bad time. This, this, this isn't bad, honestly. No. It's usually when you get over the top, though, isn't it? That's when it happens. Just here. Here we go. Okay. Ah, look. This yes. is where it starts. Yeah. I happen to have here something I carry with me at all times, a 1961 local railway timetable that says, back in 61, pre-beaching, we could have left Marple 8.40, been in Stockport 8.52. Uh, I could have still been in bed by now. 12 minutes to the journey. Well, how long have we been going already? And it was actually 10 past 8 when we set off. And it's now 8.60. And we've gone, what, a few hundred yards? Yeah. Well, basically, we've got six minutes to get to Stockport. I think we'll do it. I think Elaine will. <laughs> <laughs> she might do. There's no sign of her, is there? <laughs> yeah, you never want to have a heart attack between eight and nine on it in the morning. No. <laughs> Try and have one at the weekend. Absolutely. <laughs> It, well, it does seem crazy when you think that a fairly clean and fast form of transport could have got us only 12 minutes. Back in 1940 like odd years ago, you know. That's right. Nearly right. half a century ago. Yeah. I mean, the people who commute here every day, 
when he's an hour there and an hour back minimum, two hours a day, 10 hours a week, how many hours do you want in your life? I mean, yeah. you're taking years off your life expectancy with this thing. No, it must be like a nightmare. Well, it is a nightmare, complete nightmare. I mean, look at the clock there, we should have been in Stockport two minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. Going to the timetable. Yeah. Where's Elaine? I was just thinking that. Can I remind <laughs> you that Elaine is nowhere to be seen? I know. Beaching thought that this, the car would solve everything. Beaching thought this was the answer to everything, was the transport of the future, you know what I mean? Where you can rocket along to, from Marple yeah. to Stockport at four miles an hour. Yeah. I'm looking at it coming in the other way. Yeah. I didn't know so many people came to Marple. Maybe they just <laughs> want to get out of Stockport. Yeah. Well, is there a realistic alternative? Well, the only alternative is to put the train back. Yeah, or run like Elaine's done. Or run like it, yes. I think she's there, up there. Wow. As the bus goes away, there she is. Can you see her? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, we've got a chance of catching her up here. Yes. Oh, we've got a clear run, he said, getting excited pathetically about the fact that in a car we might catch someone up who's running. <laughs> Do you want to lay <laughs> Do we win anything? <laughs> Do we get anything? The thing is, if we get back in traffic, you know, she's going to pass us again. Do you think? Yes. Oh, yeah. With our noses virtually at the finishing line, Elaine just would not take her defeat. It's only an actual what? 100 yards behind us. Is she? She's going to overtake us now, is she? Wait. Oh, <laughs> there she goes. Still taking that lorry. <laughs> Bye. Get a car. <laughs> it's so much less stress. <laughs> oh, yeah. No stress in here. Yeah. I suppose the one thing I'm thinking. The only good thing about doing this journey by car is if you want to learn to speak Japanese or listen to, you know, Wagner's Ring Cycle, you've got a lot of time in your car to do things like that, haven't you? Because you're pretty much living in it, aren't you? Any sign of her? No, oh, that's where she works. No. Now, at this point in the journey, taking pity on Elaine after her thrashing, we thought we'd save her a few hundred yards by waiting at her place of work, which is on the way to our original finishing line at the station. Except, it seemed she may have taken a different route. Where is she? Honour dictated, we resume the race. Well, she has either stopped or she's gone past us by going a different way. Well, she would come down here. Well, is that cheating? No, it's just... It just <laughs> I mean, we never, we never planned the route, did we? No, we didn't tell her how. No, that's true. We didn't tell her how she had to get as long as she did it on foot. Yeah, yeah. No, I can't see it. No, I can't see it. Have you seen it? Yeah. London on the eighty two and a half. Yeah. And you could be there almost as quick as you could be in Marple. Where is she? Oh, there she is. But she looks as if she's only just arrived. Well, she's there. Yeah. yeah. So she's... She's been there. Yeah. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you cheat? I was looking at you. There are ways. <laughs> you don't even care to breath. Did you get on the bus? I've been waiting for you for a minute. Did you? <laughs> Blimey. You got some water? No, I'm all right. I don't believe that. Well, congratulations. Well done. <laughs> Begrudgingly said to the taxi, <laughs> yeah. So there you go. 40 years on from those marvellous reforms, a woman on foot can now beat a car, which is just as well as there aren't any trains. Thanks a lot, Dr Beachy. Didn't want that. One. <laughs> so Stevens can seize the frame forthwith. That was a fluke he didn't want. Stevens led.